Hello and welcome. My name is Alexander Moreira, and today we're going to be discussing the problem. It's Moo in time three. In this problem, we are given a long string S and two positions L and R, and we want to determine the maximum value of this math expression. This math expression consists of three variables, I, J, and K, and they are subject to a few constraints. Informally, I, J, and K must be increasing and between the values L and R, and I, J, and K must form a mu in the string S. What this means is that the character at position I has to be not equal to the character at position J, which then in turn has to be equal to the character in position K. Sort of like the word mu, right? M is not equal to O, but then O is equal to itself. And let's take a look at some examples here. So let's suppose that L is 1 and R is 8, and our string looks like this. So A, B, B, C, A, B, B, C. And just to make things easier, I've labeled all of the positions in the string from 1 to 8. So this is the character in position 1, character in position 2, and so on. And let's suppose we take the, care, uh, the uh, values for i, j, and k to be 1, 3, 6. This forms a mu because we can see in position 1, we have an a, in position 3, we have a b, and in position 6, we have another b. So this gives us the mu a, b, b. And if we plug the values of i, j, and k into our formula here, we get the expression 3 minus 1 times 6 minus 3, which comes out to 2 times 3, which is also known as 6. But we can do better here. In particular, if we take i, j, and k to be the values 1, 4, and 8, this gives me the mu a, c, c, then I can do a lot better. Now if I plug i, j, and k into the expression, I get 4 minus 1 times 8 minus 4 is 12. So the first thing you want to do in this problem is to understand this math expression, and in particular, how the values of i, j, and k interact to maximize it. And this leads us to our first key observation. To maximize j minus i times k minus j, we want i to be as small as possible. So over here on this Desmos screen, I have plotted the math expression in terms of j. So as x increases, um, j is equal to x. And I've hard coded in values for i and k. If I increase i, we can see that the peak of this expression gets smaller and smaller. As I decrease i, we can see that the peak of the expression gets higher and higher. That's because I'm subtracting off smaller and smaller values. So that makes sense. Furthermore, on, on, or sort of opposite to that, as I increase k, the peak gets higher and higher. So while I want i to be as small as possible, I want k to be as large as possible. And then finally, for j, we can see that as we trace from i all the way around down to the current value of k, the expression is maximized when j is as close to the middle as possible. So we want j to be as close to halfway between i and k as we can. So we can see that this expression, or this, this current setup for the values of i, j, and k, is better than this, because primarily because it has this larger value of k. So what we want to do here is we want to find a mu with a particularly small value of i, a particularly large value of k, and j to be centered nicely halfway in between the first two, the first and last letters. So one way of approaching this is with the brute force strategy. So let's pop over the code and take a look at a partial credit solution that's going to help inform us to obtain full credit. So far, all I've done in the code is read in the input. So n is the length of the string, q is the number of queries, and s is the string itself. Then for each query, I'm going to read in a pair of values, l and r, and note that I'm subtracting one from both of those values so that they are zero indexed, which allows me to interface well with the string whose positions start counting at zero. 
Then I want to create a maximum variable to store the maximum possible value of this math expression. Next, I'm going to loop over every single letter in the alphabet and check what happens when that letter forms the oo part of my mu. So in particular, what happens when that character is equal to sj and sk, but not equal to si. And note that there are a lot of better ways to loop over the alphabet. In particular, in your own code, you should just use the ASCII table. However, this is a visually striking sort of demonstration here. Everyone can see what's happening here. The character is just looping through each letter in the alphabet. So however you choose to, to do this in your language, you can just know there are better ways to do it. You don't have to type out the alphabet. And then we are going to find I. This is just the first position. Right, we want I to be as small as possible. So we're going to find the first position not equal to CH. So to do that, we're going to loop from L to R. If SI is not equal to CH, we're going to break. I now stores the earliest position that is not equal to CH in the string. Then we can repeat the same idea to find K. We want this to be the last position equal to CH, because again, we want K to be as large as possible. So we're going to loop K backwards, starting at the right-hand side, so starting at R, and going backwards to L. And we are going to search if SK is equal to CH, we are going to break. Now K is going to store the last position in the string between L and R that takes on the value CH. So we found the position of SI, we found the optimum position of SK, and all that's left is to find the best value of S. J. And to do that, we could brute force over all possible values between i and k and save the maximum result here. Again, the optimum result is going to be whatever value of j falls as close to the halfway point between i and k as po um, between i and k. So let's take a look here. So we're going to loop j starting at i plus one and going to strictly less than k. So right up to, but not including k. So this is going to loop from starting at i plus 1. It's going to go to i plus 2 all the way up to k minus 2, k minus 1. And then it's going to stop right before it reaches position k. Because we don't want i and or j and k to accidentally be pointing to the same letter. This could lead to a false positive. And then if sj is equal to ch, I have found my middle character in the mu, so I can compute the math formula and save the maximum. So the maximum just gets updated to be the max of all the previous maximums and the current value of the math expression computed here. And at the end of the program, I print maximum. As it stands right now, this code will receive partial credit because for each of the Q queries, we are performing a linear search, actually three separate linear searches, to find the values i, k, and j. If we want full credit on this question, we have to replace all three of these linear searches with something faster. And here we have sort of two techniques that are going to be useful. The first is pre-computation, and the second is binary search. In particular, we can pre-compute an array that will take in a character and a position L and return the index I instantaneously. So we'll compute this array. And then for each of our queries, we can just plug in CH and L, and it'll immediately spit out the next different character. For these last two loops, we can replace both of these with a binary search call. The reason for this is we are searching for the character ch in all of the positions where ch occurs. So uh, we'd be searching for what is the closest occurrence of ch to the position r. And then for j, we want to know what is the closest occurrence of ch to i plus k over 2. Remember back when we were going through our notes, we observed that the best place to put j is halfway between positions i and k. So uh, we're going to go transition over to a new code here, where we're going to be using binary search and a pre-computation step to speed it up. But the overall structure here will remain the same. So we've still got our loop over the Q queries. We're going to loop over all the characters. And again, we're going to repeat this idea of finding the best value of i, best value of k, and the best value of j. 
to make this possible, uh, the key observation is that for each character, we need to pre-compute a list of all indices where CH occurs. This will allow us to complete our binary search. And then second, a map from index I to the index of the next character not equal to CH. And this is going to allow us to complete step one here. So just as quick examples of what this would look like, suppose I had the string A, B, B, C, A, B, B, C, and I was looking at the character B. We'd have to compute these data structures for every single character, but let's just do it for one character for now. And I've written uh, the zero indexed positions below the letters. So for example, positions B, would store 1, 2, 5, and 6, because those are the positions where B occurs in the string S. And the array next different B would store 0, 3, 3, 3, 4, and then all 7s. The key idea is if a character is not equal to B, next different at that position just stores the index. But if the character is equal to a B at a given spot, next different will store the position of the next character that's not equal to b so for example when we're in positions one and two we see that those are both b so next different stores three in those positions because the next character that's not equal to b is c in position three so what we're going to do is we're going to pre-compute these two arrays for every single character and then we are going to uh, use them to find the three values we're interested in one thing to note here is I've transformed the string S into an array of numbers by subtracting 97, which is the ASCII value of A, from every single character in the string. This is just going to make it easier to um, index my two arrays here. So let's start off by calculating this positions structure. Note that I'm going to be calculating 26 separate lists because there are 26 letters in the alphabet. So we're going to have one list for the positions of, um, we're going to have 26 different lists, one for each letter. So we're going to loop over all of the characters in S. And for each character we see, we're going to add its position to its list. So if this is A, we'd add I to A's list. If this is B, we'd add I to B's list, and so on. And again, uh, this is why we've subtracted off 97 here from the, the character, so that SI is just some number between 0 and 25. To calculate next different, we have to be uh, put in a little bit more work here. Um, so we're going to start by declaring a length n array for all 26 characters. And we're going to loop over the string backwards. And if a character is not equal to the current character we're looking at, we're just going to write down the current index. However, if a character is equal to uh, the current character we're looking at, then we're just going to write down the previous index. So, um, or the previous index in the next different or difference array. So let's loop over CH. So this is just handling one character at a time. We're going to loop over the string backwards. We're going to start by setting uh, next equal to CH j equal to ch j plus one. So this just sets it to the previous value in the array. And then if the character happens to not be equal to the current character we care about, then we're going to update next ch j to the index j. And this is going to create this data structure. If this next difference thing doesn't make a whole lot of sense, there is an alternative option here where you could store, in addition to all of the positions where a character occurs, you could create another array and store all of the positions where that character does not occur. And then you could binary search over that as well if you wanted. So you could just do this entire problem with binary search. But it's also nice to know sort of these, these pre-computation ideas. We are now ready to find i, k, and j. To achieve this, we're going to leverage our two pre-computed arrays here. To find i, we just access the next array at position chl. Again, this returns to us the index of the first character not equal to ch after position l. Once we have i, we can go on to finding k using binary search. And in particular, we're going to be searching all of the positions of the current character ch 
for the index r. So we want to find the closest character to r. This is going to give us the rightmost copy of ch in the string s. If find k is negative 1, we didn't find anything, so we're just going to, going to continue on to the next character. Otherwise, we can access the value of k by retrieving the corresponding position in the positions array. So remember, position ch just stores all of the positions of ch in the string s. The index find k is the rightmost copy of ch with the constraint that we can't go further right than r. So if we access this, this spits out the best position to use for our process here. So we have i and k. We can find j by taking the average of i and k and searching for that in, again, the positions chra using binary search. Before we do that, we're going to first confirm that um, i is strictly less than k. If that's not true, then this process doesn't make any sense, right? So i has to be smaller than k in order for our sequence to be valid here. So uh, to find j, we're going to again call binary search. We're searching position ch this time, not for position r, because we're not interested in the rightmost copy. We're interested in the copy closest to this position, i plus k divided by 2. So this is just the halfway point between i and k. The problem that we're going to encounter, however, is when we get the value for find j, the best element may be to the left of position i plus k over 2, or it could be to the right of i plus k over 2. So since I don't know which one is better, so the, the sort of nearest value to the left or the nearest value to the right, I'm just going to test both of them. So we're going to have a, a small loop here. x is going to loop over the values 0, 1. And I'm going to test the positions um, when x is 0. That's going to give me the thing directly to the right of i plus k over 2. When x is 1, that's going to give me the thing to the left of i plus k over 2. Um, and then if the inequality here is satisfied, then I can update the maximum to be the max of maximum, all previous maximums found, and the current value of our math expression. So in terms of exam strategy for this question, I think the, the most reasonable thing to do here is shoot for partial credit. Um, it's a fairly straightforward algorithm, uh, especially in comparison to the full credit algorithm, and then sort of focus more on problems one and two. However, um, it's also nice to always have the full credit solution in our back pocket as well. Um, we do have to use binary search here. This is because you know it's the third problem on the open, so you're going to experience sort of more advanced techniques than you'd see in your typical bronze contest. So thank you guys so much for watching the video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.